Hi everyone. Here we are going to get into apparent motion and our celestial sphere. So for today, um, we will remember the order of our planets from uh, in the distance from the sun. We are going to look at and explain the way our celestial sphere is broken into 88 constellations. And we'll be able to explain the apparent motion westward of that celestial sphere, why it looks like things in the sky move from east to west. So one of the really large challenges in studying astronomy and beginning to study astronomy is being able to look from different perspectives or being able to imagine or being able to interpret an image or a drawing that is drawn from different perspectives. So you have to learn and not even learn, but more like get used to viewing the universe from different perspectives. So there's sort of two different perspectives that we talk about. One is the perspective from Earth. So on Earth, it looks like the sun and the stars rise in the east and they set in the west. So that is from Earth. That is what we see here standing on Earth. So we have to learn how to shift from the Earth perspective to an outside perspective. So the outside perspective is where you're outside of the Earth. So you're actually viewing the Earth spinning on its axis and orbiting around the sun. So we can look at things from the Earth, from the surface of the Earth, Earth's point of view, or our point of view here on Earth, and then also step back and look at Earth from afar. So we're going to be switching between these two points of view pretty much all semester. Um, so this can be something tricky, but it is something that just takes a little bit of time to get used to thinking in that way. So when we think about the Earth's point of view, we think about uh, what is called apparent motion. So apparent motion is the fact that the sun and the stars and the moon appear to move from east to west across the sky. So our sun, it rises in the east, it's at its highest altitude around noon, and then it sets in the west. So from Earth, the apparent motion of the sun is east to west across our sky. So the stars also move, so it's not just the sun. The stars also rise in the east, move across the sky, and set in the west. So early astronomers would imagine the night sky as what we call the celestial sphere. So it was a rotating sphere that was fixed all around Earth, and it moved around the Earth, moving the stars in the sky with it. So they imagined that all of these constellations here were part of this fixed celestial sphere, almost like a, a larger sphere around the Earth. Everything was fixed and that thing was spinning. Early astronomers, we now know they were wrong, but they were onto some good points. Um, in those ancient times, the sky was organized into groups of stars and they were named after mythical creatures, heroes, gods by shape. So, uh, people would look up, see some different shapes, and name the shape after something uh, mythological or um, a different god. So the boundaries between constellations didn't really exist. Um, it was just this group of stars that we can recognize night after night, we will call it this. Here's another group of stars, we recognize that one night after night, we'll call it this other thing. That was a way to track the constellations, see how things moved. Uh, nowadays, we have 88 constellations with very precisely defined boundaries. So there's 48 that were taken from ancient times, and there are 40 more modern constellations that have been added in order to cover the entire sky. So our whole sky is broken up into 88 constellations. Uh, most of the names are Greek that have then been translated into Latin. So a constellation is an area of the sky, so an area of that celestial sphere. So here is the outline of the boundary of Ursa Major, the constellation. So this blue line is outlining 
uh, the boundary of this constellation. So anything within this boundary is part of this constellation. So this spot where we're not seeing a star in this diagram, still part of Ursa Major. Over here, still part of Ursa Major. So the constellation is the whole area of sky. So this whole area outlined by blue is this constellation. So this is one of the constellations that was taken from um, the ancient times because uh, it was named after a large bear. So you might notice that within this constellation, you see a very recognizable shape that is the Big Dipper. So here we have the Big Dipper. It is part of the Ursa Major constellation. It is called an asterism. So an asterism is a famous or well-known group of stars. So the Big Dipper is not its own constellation. It is part of the constellation of Ursa Major. So Orion's Belt, the Square of Pegasus, those are other um, asterisms that are more commonly known, recognized groups of stars. They are part of other constellations. So this is a piece of the sky, not the whole thing, of course, and you'll see that the yellowish lines are um, dividing the different constellations. So these boundaries meet perfectly. Uh, they are dividing the entire sky all the way around the Earth um, into 88 different shape, different size pieces. So we are dividing that celestial sphere, the whole view of the sky around Earth, into 88 pieces. So for example, here is Hercules. All of the stars that are within this boundary from the vantage point of Earth, we consider to be part of the Hercules constellation. So the celestial sphere, I've mentioned it a couple times, um, it is sort of an imaginary sphere that we often talk about as if it's real. <laughs> so the uh, imaginary sphere consists of all celestial bodies. So everything out in space, we imagine if it was projected onto one sphere, we call that the celestial sphere. So this sphere where everything on space is sort of projected, excuse me, everything in space is projected onto the sphere outside of Earth, it looks like it is constant and rotating around us. So nothing within the sphere is moving uh, in comparison to the rest. It's not as if one star one night will be down over here. They all move together. They all, all of the stars rotate together from the Earth's point of view. They rotate around the Earth from our point of view. We know that the celestial sphere is not rotating, and it's Earth that's rotating, which causes this apparent motion of stars from east to west. So here's really a little bit more what it looks like. Um, if we were to project everything we can see onto the sphere, it's actually Earth that's rotating inside of it. So Earth rotates to the east. That causes the planets, the moon, and all of the stars to appear to move to the west in the sky. So the whole celestial sphere appears like it moves to the west throughout the day, throughout the night, because the Earth is rotating to the east. So if you were to take a long exposure photo on the beach such as this, in a beautiful spot where you can see many, many stars, um, this camera must have been left out for multiple hours. So you can see the trail of these stars actually moving throughout the night. So this is where you left the camera out for many hours, captured an image, you can see the light from the stars actually moving across the night sky. So our constellations are totally our own creation and they're unique to Earth because the stars in the constellations aren't necessarily next to each other. Generally, they're many, many light years apart. It's just that from our point of view, it looks like they're next to each other. So from Earth, it looks like these stars are clumped together into a shape that looks like a bear or looks like a scorpion. They appear to be grouped together to us into these shapes and patterns that we recognize. So here in the sky, we see the asterism of the Big Dipper. However, in reality, here is Earth, and the stars are very far apart. It's just that when we see them from our point of view, it looks like they are close together. So these constellations are not actually near each other. 
They aren't actually close to each other. It's just from our point of view that we see these stars in this order, in this, these patterns. So when we think about the distance between stars or of stars, there's two terms that we use. So one is the angular distance. So this is where we're looking at the distance between two objects. So if you're standing right here, looking out, you want to say, how far is the moon from this star? You know that you're looking out at this sort of celestial sphere, which is a sphere. So we measure the distance in angle. So from our viewpoint, our vantage point, what is the distance? What is the angle between these two objects? So this distance, the angular distance, would be reported in degrees. So you would have a um, distance of degrees between the star and the moon. Now the angular diameter is very similar, but instead of the distance between two objects, we're thinking how large is that object? So how much of the celestial sphere does that object take up? So how large is this in terms of an angle? So let's look at the moon and the sun as an example. So the diameter of the moon, so the size of the moon, is uh, 2,159 miles across or through, if you were to drill from one side of the moon to the other side. If you were to do that with the sun, uh, you would melt before you got there, but it would be 864,340 miles. So the sun's quite a bit larger than the moon. So if we were to think back about our scientific notation, which we just learned, what is the diameter of the sun in kilometers in scientific notation? So if we were to put this number into scientific notation, first step, we know we have to move that decimal place so that there's only one value to the left of the decimal. We only need a ones place. So we have to move that um, decimal point one, two, three, four, five, six places. So we know that this is going to be um, times 10 to the power of 6. So we would write it like this, 1.391 times 10 to the power of 6 kilometers. Awesome, just a review of our scientific notation. So now let's think about the sun and the moon and compare them to each other. So how many times larger is the sun than the moon? So if we want to compare, we want to make a ratio or simply divide. So we would take the diameter of the sun divided by the diameter of the moon. We want to ensure that we're using the same units so that we're getting a real comparison. So if we divide the diameter of the moon, excuse me, the diameter of the sun by the diameter of the moon, we learn that the sun is actually 400 times larger than the moon. 400 times larger. That is huge. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon. However, can you tell here on Earth, can you tell that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon? Can you tell that the sun is larger than the moon at all from Earth? Um, no. <laughs> from Earth, the, the diameter of the sun and the moon actually look to be almost exactly the same. So from Earth, an observer on Earth, it looks like the sun and the moon are the same size. They take up almost the exact same amount of space in the celestial sphere, in our viewpoint from Earth. They're, they have almost exactly the same angular diameter. How is that possible? We just calculated that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. So how do they look exactly the same size from Earth? Well, the sun is about 400 times further away from the Earth than the moon is. So that math works out really well for us. <laughs> the sun is 400 times larger, but also 400 times further away. So from the viewpoint of the Earth, they actually appear to be almost the same size. So that is the angular diameter. So how big does something appear to be from Earth? So both the moon and the sun appear to have the same or do have the same angular diameter from Earth. 
So how large is an object on that celestial sphere? So this is something that is um, reported in degrees, arc minutes, and arc seconds. So degrees, just like a regular angle. So a degree, this little circle here, is made up of minutes and seconds. So if you want to be more precise than a degree, we wouldn't just say uh, 1.5 degrees. We would say 1 degree 30 minutes. Because in each degree, there's 60 minutes. In each minute, there's 60 seconds. So it's just like time. If degrees were hours, minutes are minutes and seconds are seconds. So within a degree, you have 60 minutes. And within a minute, you have 60 seconds. So this is a way um, to use to be more precise. So if you don't want to round all the way to the nearest degree because you need to be really precise, you're going to be using minutes and seconds. So it follows a clock just like time. So this um, angular diameter, how much space does something take up on the sky, uh, the same calculation is done to determine the distance. So that angular distance between star B, star A, we would have this angle here, the apparent angle from our viewpoint on Earth, and it would be reported the same way in um, degrees, minutes, and seconds. So a little quick guide cheat to angular measurements. If you hold your arm out, extend it fully, and then up at the sky, uh, your pinky takes up about one degree of space. So you, if you hold your arm fully extended, um, your pinky should cover the moon and the sun. They're about one degree. Uh, if you were to do a full fist, that covers about 10 degrees of sky, of celestial sphere. Um, if you were to do uh, the shaka here, extend your thumb and your pinky, that covers about 25 degrees of sky. So if you're looking to do some quick angular measurements, um, you can use this uh, quick guide. It's pretty good, but it's not very accurate. But it is great to get a grasp on what these values actually mean. So um, lastly, when we're thinking about stars and constellations, uh, they all have names. So there are Greek letters that are used to designate within a constellation uh, the brightness of the star. So the brightest star within that constellation will be called Alpha, the first Greek letter. So a star within a constellation is going to be called the Greek letter and then the constellation name. So for example, the brightest star in uh, Canis Major the constellation, is going to be Alpha Canis Majoris. This star is also known as Sirius and is the brightest star in our sky. But it is the brightest star within its constellation, so it is called Alpha and then the name of the constellation. So there are a few constellations that do not perfectly follow this pattern due to error <laughs> or a preference of the early chart makers that originally started naming these stars, or tradition. So there's some stars that were uh, already famous and already well known, so that name might be used in place of um, this uh, Greek letter and then a constellation name regime, which we normally use. Here is a picture of Earth rising um, from the surface of the moon.